I guess that uh, uh, usually we, we go for a new round for second mm -hmm. remarks to be made, particularly to criticize what had been said by the mm -hmm. other uh, members of the panel, or to compliment, or to do anything. But <laughs> any of us has the, the will to communicate something that would be complementary to what has been said. Otherwise, I, I go again, Gabriel. <laughs> you would be the, the first for this second remark. Would you agree? Yes. You have the floor. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, no, I, there's, there's not much uh, disagreement here, I think, uh, amongst the, the four of us. Uh, unfortunate for the, uh, for the conference, of course. Uh, but uh, uh, I think what we, we must uh, stress more than we did uh, in these last uh, 45 minutes is the internal uh, frictions that we're facing uh, in, within the United States and within Europe, uh, probably also within China. We don't see much into it, but, uh, but I, I guess it's, it's, it's there as well as an explanation for what we see in our external relationships. And yeah. uh, uh, you know, if you look at uh, the, the uh, regional elections in Germany in the last months, uh, you see the increasing polarization uh, that's fed by inflation, uh, but it pushes countries into a, into a more, let's say, um, aggressive external policy stance as well. Uh, and uh, the conundrum is, uh, on the one hand, uh, to, to get inflation down to, to make sure that the internal cohesion improves. Uh, on the other hand, this, this external assertionness or whatever it is, call it decoupling or de-risking or, or um, the search for strategic autonomy, all these things, that is actually making it harder to achieve those uh, uh, internal cohesion objectives. No? But as has been said, no? the fragmentation is costly. And, uh, and, and that will be borne by whom? No? Most likely for the most vulnerable. Uh, and it makes these this, uh, in internal divisions even stronger. So that's a conundrum that I, I, I see I'm a little bit um, out of wits here. I don't, I don't know how we can deal with that, but I, th I think the first step will be to, has to be to see that, uh, that those uh, uh, de-risking policies tend to increase inequality. And, and then that fosters polarization with consequences that lead to more uh, external uh, frictions. Um, Thank you. Clear enough, clear enough. Sebastian, what would you say? Thank you. Um, first, perhaps a, a, a comment about um, uh, the fact that uh, we are uh, discussing the, the difficulty of coordination, the difficulty to stick to uh, international commitments and rules. I just want to emphasize that I, I, I think it shouldn't come as a surprise that rules, uh, multilateral rules, are not able to contain uh, grid power competition, because by themselves uh, they cannot. Uh, rules are unable to, 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 to contain grid power competition as long as there is no political agreement uh, upon the, the direction, the objectives. And so I think that should be uh, reaching some kind of uh, political ag uh, agreement uh, about uh, the, the, the framework of coordination should be the priority. Uh, the second point uh, has to do with uh, um, uh, coordination and uh, inflation. Uh, a lot has been said about uh, the financial risks uh, entailed by the policies, uh, uh, monetary policies in uh, advanced economies recently. I think it's a good illustration of the threats uh, involved by the lack of coordination, uh, uh, the fact that it will increase the asymmetries in the world economies. In the world economy, it will make it, it makes it increasingly uh, difficult to uh, take into account a variety of objectives because uh, um, uh, it, it will uh, um, make coordination on various counts uh, uh, less less easy. Uh, the, um, uh, the, de the, the development, the spread of industrial policies is another example because that's only something that uh, countries with uh, uh, enough financing can sustain. Uh, so it's also a source of asymmetry, of lack of inclusiveness at the, at the world level. Yeah. Thank, you, thank you very much. <coughs> Your remarks uh, were valid uh, for uh, Europe as well as for the uh, global economy. I have to say, I am struck myself by the uh, convergence on both sides of the Atlantic 
on the monetary policies, on the first results of monetary policy, core inflation being more or less the same. When we were in very difficult position, the Europeans were uh, uh, hit by the war in Europe much more than the US, obviously, in terms of, uh, I would say, price of oil, price of, uh, of food, the fact that uh, the US is self-sufficient uh, in many respects, uh, both in fossil uh, mm. fuel and also for uh, food. Uh, and that, that, of course, creates a difference which is very, very substantial, obviously. And uh, nevertheless, I mean, the goal remains the same. The likelihood of reaching the goal is, in my view, as credible as uh, it was before, before war in Europe. And so that, that, that is something which is the silver lining, if I may, in comparison with what you, we, you had on both sides of the Atlantic after the first and the second oil shock, which was totally dramatic. Uh, inflation unleashed, uh, inflation uh, steady at 14%, uh, and interest rates at times at 20%. So we are, uh, I would say, claiming that 5% uh, in the US, 4% in Europe is too much, but I mean, <laughs> we experience 20 because we made mistakes in the previous mm. time, in the previous oil shock. Anyway, uh, what would you say, John, yourself? Well, uh, First of all, just to uh, continue on with what you've just been saying, the, uh, it's very positive that we've made progress on inflation. And like you say, that uh, at least for the moment, the, the progress is quite similar on both sides when we look at core inflation. What may be left as a residual effect of, among other things, uh, the uh, war in Ukraine, is a difference, a change in price structure relative to what it was pre previously. In other words, it's quite likely that relative prices of energy in Europe is going to remain higher than it was previously. In other words, this is undoubtedly going to be associated with structural change in economic growth in, in Europe and in trade patterns as well. Another aspect uh, I wanted to mention was that we've we saw an incredible boom in the Chinese economy in, re in past years that was associated with huge increase in demand for basic commodities, metals, et cetera, uh, of imports to the Chinese economy from, from elsewhere, huge increase in exports of manufactured goods from China. Uh, my sense uh, from my recent visit is uh, China is changing substantially. Uh, the, the, the source of their economic growth is going to have to change and it's going to slow down and the growth in domestic demand in China is slowing down and is likely to main, remain relatively calm relative to what it's been previously. And that's one reason why trade is going to remain more subdued and different than it was before, not just because of subsidies, of course that's part of it, and uh, not just because of sanctions, but because of some underlying underlying changes in, in the global economy. That brings me uh, back and uh, wanted to make an, one a, a quick uh, a comment. So we've seen these these uh, large challenges, and I would say, and we've, uh, as Sam pointed out, that previously, when the G20 was founded in the context of the global financial crisis, it was able to act decisively because among other things, there was a lack of, of a sense of great power conflict, as you remember. That it wasn't that individual countries forgot their, their interests. It was a, a real sense that if we don't hang together, we will, we will hang separately. But time has shown the weakness of the structure or lack of structure of the G20, that it has on the one hand put itself as above the multilateral institutions but itself has no legal standing and has no voting process other than there's a, a veto power on the part of every, of every uh, participant. As a result, it's an organization that is, finds itself very hard, or I don't even want to call it an organization, but uh, it's an entity that finds it hard to reach decisions and command action 
in a context of d either difficult or conflictive uh, issues. And I think it's, uh, it's worth contemplating whether if we're going to make real progress on global public goods that inevitably are going to involve difficult decisions that are not necessarily uh, to everybody's liking, if we're going to have to think about whether they need to be reassigned in one way or another to multilateral institutions that do have a structure that leads the decisions and can reach, um, uh, dis legitim uh, reach decisions that have legal legitimacy even in issues in which there's not complete consensus. Thank you, John. What you say is certainly true at the level of the United Nations and uh, the Security Council and so forth. I am a little bit more optimistic after the last uh, G20 meeting in Delhi. It seemed to me that uh, the, the concept of international community was still alive, a little bit alive. <laughs> That being said, <laughs> of course, it's not perfect. Marcus, you, you had already the privilege to hear all of us, so what would you say now? Okay. The second one, round. One, one last gasp of international community. So if you set aside the geopolitical concerns and just focus on climate change, there's clearly a need for the United States, the European Union, and China to get on the same page and find ways of reconciling their diverse approaches to this problem. Uh, my institution recently hosted a conference on uh, the macroeconomics of climate change organized by Jean Pisani Ferry. Uh, and there was a paper presented there by two of my colleagues, Chad Bound and Kim Clausing, who argue that relatively minor changes to the WTO rules could go a long way in reducing conflict between the EU, the US, and China on climate-related issues. The problem, of course, is even minor changes to the WTO rules are going to require a real diplomatic commitment. Mm. And I don't know if we're up to it or not. Well, very good remark indeed. So good cooperation between Peterson and uh, uh, Pisani, Jean Pisani Ferry. I, I was myself uh, chair of the uh, board of directors of uh, Bruegel Institute. So uh, I see that. Uh, and we, we have also a friend of the Bruegel Institute who's also in Peterson, if I'm not misled, uh, Nicolas. Anyway. So